um, Jai Bai, apart from people in Bengal, hardly anyone know Sri Ram Krishna Paramahansa. Why, in your opinion, he is important personality to study? And why did Swami Vivekananda call him Avatar or Istai? Okay. You see, in fact, I ask myself, how come this great master, a great modern spiritual master of India, remains unknown in India? Apart from people in Bengal, rest of India perhaps have not even heard the name Sri Ramakrishna. There are so many other personalities that people talk about, modern personalities, but Sri Ramakrishna is hardly ever mentioned. So as a, as a, as a youngster, I said, why? Why is this so? Why is this person ignored and not being given full dignity he deserves? And I answer is as, as follows. You see, this man did not go out to promote a sectarian movement. You require a sectarian movement to promote yourself. You will not bother. Another thing is, people, ordinary people, only like magic and miracles. And this man was not interested in promoting any magic or miracles. And Hindus say, oh, unless there's magic, you know, this, you, we can't relate to him. The third reason is this. If you notice, most of the modern personalities well known in India are those people who give boons. You worship me and I'll sort out all your problems. Just come and sit at my feet. I'll sort you out. You can ask for your health issues, your wealth issues, your social. I'll solve everything for you. This is standard way modern personality like to promote themselves. For an ordinary man, this is what they are interested in. They don't interested in anything higher. This wants their material status to be preserved, their health to be preserved, their social standing to be preserved. So that's what they're interested in. So this Ramakrishna doesn't appear at all interesting at all. That is another reason. And the most cutting thing that you said is this. How come this Vivekananda, a very sober, sensible individual, calls him Avatar Varishthaya? That means the super, most superior avatar. He said, but he's nothing like Ram and Krishna and Buddha. So how can we call him avatar of Varishta? People say, this is too much. He's perhaps exaggerating. He loves Ram Krishna so much, he's exaggerating. He's going over the top. To the contrary, let me tell you. Swami Vivekananda, a great master, modern master said, there is no way I can do justice to what this Ram Krishna stands for. Do you know what he said? He said, I'm not fit to tie shoelaces. That is the grandeur of this man. In fact, he would hardly talk about Sri Ramakrishna, his teacher, in his lectures. He said, the reason is very simple. I will not do justice to him. So even the great Vivekananda re recognized the dignity and the, the great power that flowed in this personality and was shy to talk about him because he will do injustice to him. This is reality. In fact, at one time in, in USA, when he was giving a talk about his master, suddenly he stopped halfway and said, no, I'm going away. I won't finish the talk. Said, Why? Why? He said, I looked at the audience. And I could see there is no way they can relate to the purity, the, the, the speciality of this personality. So I was wasting my time. So he said, I better switch off. So this great Vivekananda, why did you call him Avatar Varishtai? Let me tell you, Manish Pai is very important. You see, even you look at all the previous Avatars, they are wonderful. We love them. You know, Ram and Krishna and Buddha, we love all these Avatars. We relate to them still and wonderful, nothing wrong with it. But what has happened is this. Over thousands of years, the stories that go along with Ram and Krishna, etc., have been polished up. They have been given extremely pure, pristine colors. So we think we have, they come with four arms and you know, Shabk and Chakra and Gada and all that. That's how we view avatars. So we have lost track of the real human side of an avatar. I am telling you that when Ram was going in the forest, he was not wearing silk clothes. Who's going to do his laundry there? He was wearing, you know, leather, you know, skins. And he said, I can't show Ram like that and Sita like that. And you see, this is the, this is, we have polished it up to such an extent, we can't relate to an ordinary person, this spiritual giant. Unless they come with this external glamour, we can't relate to them. This is the weakness of the Hindus. So they are stuck. And do you know why, why we have come so worked up? You see, the previous avatars really talked about a message suitable for the Indian subcontinent, for India, for Hindus. This one is, is a real giant. The message he gives is not just for India, Hindus, it is international, universal, genuinely universal. Every religion says we are universal. Here is a man who is giving you feel like a rubber stamp to universality of the deeper vision that comes from our tradition. This is the modern vision, the more, if you like the most contemporary vision of spirituality seen in India. It is not just meant for the Hindus or India, it is meant for the greater world. That is why this Vivekananda, this sober man, had no choice but to say Avatara Varishthaya. This is the first avatar that is, if you like, truly international. His message goes through, cuts across all the religious boundaries as well as all the social and cultural and you know, country-wise boundaries. It's a very universal message, very dynamic. 
And yet, because you're not doing magic and miracle, he will not fulfill your boons. Suppose you say, oh, I pray to you, please make sure I get more money. He will give you nothing. Test him out. Nothing. You get nothing. The only thing you can get from this avatar is to, you say, I want to be spiritually awakened. He say, yes, you're in the right place. Anything else you ask from him, say, oh, more wealth and health and this, he'll say, get lost. This is a reality. So this is why this avatar is the most potent, the most contemporary vision of his spirituality, the most comprehensive vision of spirituality that came out of this modern avatar. In fact, look, when Vivekananda was asked, he said, if anything good has come out of this lips, this is Swami Vivekananda. He said, give all the credit to my master, Ramakrishna. I am just actually just, you know, waffling. The rest of it is my waffle, said Vivekananda. See how much respect and love he had. So he could easily claim this, Ra this Ramakrishna is avatar of Varishtai. And I fully agree with that. The more I study this Ramakrishna you know, message, the more I'm thrilled. I, I see the, the, if you like, the versatility of this lovely message that has come out of this individual. So I'm going on because I love this man as well. Sir, um, he, uh, Ram, Sri Ramakrishna, he even practiced Christianity and Islam and said they lead to the same destination. How can this be true as their perception of spiritual living is vastly different from the Hindu pathway? Yes. Like heaven and hell in contrast to reincarnation. You see, one of the features about Sri Ramakrishna is, he, he, first of all, the reason why I love him is another reason why it's a comprehensive vision of Hinduism. Every avatar would promote, say, Vaishnavism or Shaivism, etc. This individual came, first of all, to see if there's a reconciliation between different pathways the Hindus, Hindus have adopted to make spiritual progress. So he tried Vaishnava tradition, he tried the Shaiva tradition, the Shakta tradition. He tried every aspect or every different path of making spiritual progress within Hinduism. And the, the wonderful thing is, he is such a powerful, dynamic personality. He was successful in every pathway he tried. So he said, all these pathways lead to the same destination. So far, so good. Only reconcile the Hindu vision. He said, no, he's a greedy fellow. He said, no, I want to see if this perception that I have about ultimate reality can be checked out using other religious traditions. And this is a fantastic thing. First time an individual, not able to verify various Hindu movements and reconcile them, he said, I want to try various religions. And the two religions he tried out is Christianity and Islam. These are the two major religions. He said, let me try Christianity, see if it takes me to the same destination. Let me try Islam as well, whether it takes me to the same destination. And he succeeded. And this is, he said, ultimate reality that I experience is same whether I'm using Christianity, Islam or Hindu, any of the Hindu movements. Now people say, Mr. Lakhani, but that is a bit weird because you see the, the theology of Christianity or Islam is this two life scenario. This life and the never, never, you know, everlasting life as in heaven or hell. So how can this nothing with reincarnation of Hindus? So how can you say they are same? They are, he never said they are same. He said they lead me to the same destiny. You say, but how can you, re Mr. Lakhani, how do you reconcile? This is how I reconcile. If a person is genuinely spiritually oriented, he will basically talk about the spiritual experience he had. The doctrines that surround that spiritual experience are kind of produced by theologians, not by the master. The theologians get round and say, oh, this is what he meant. So even this idea of two life scenario you see in Christianity was something that Christ didn't promote. But the theologians who are kind of, you know, the, the father of Christianity said, okay, this is the best way to keep our flock in line. So they don't jump. They don't sit on the fence. Be careful, either heaven or hell, carrot and stick. So let's plug it in. So the theologians in all these Abrahamic traditions have put in their own version regarding the spiritual experience of their master. The masters are right. Ramakrishna has tried out and it works. But the theology that goes round with these various kind of religions are seriously flawed. I'm saying it bluntly flawed. Even within certain Hindu movements, some of the theology that goes with it is flawed. And yet the, the masters who kind of, whether it's Ramana Acharya or Shankaracharya, the rest destination is the same. That is why. This wonderful reconciliation we see with Sri Ramakrishna gives dignity and acceptability to all world traditions, not only Hindu traditions, in the genuine manner. He said, I see the same, fine, at the final level, I see the same destination. You see, because when I talk about pluralism, it's many way to be, ways to be spiritual, including many different religious pathways. People say, Mr. Lakhani, how do you know? Because maybe this is called relativism, it's anything goes, you're promoting anything goes. We never said that because the destination is same. Who says it? Any textbook? No. One individual. In the history of humanity, there's only one individual who claims, not just because you read a book, 
is you know, negotiating their theology he is actually experienced that the final level that he reaches when he uses any of the pathways is the same because one, like, one kind of challenge they throw in my face is this could we use this example in pluralism saying that it's like climbing up the mountain using different pathways so Christianity goes one way up Islam goes the other way up Hinduism goes the other way up so they say maybe it's climb, using different pathways to go to the top of the mountain but the, 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 the challenge I get, and love this kind of challenge is from the atheists and from people who want to target me. They say, Mr. Lakani, how do you know it's the same mountain they're climbing? Maybe they're climbing different mountains. What's the proof? It's a very serious challenge. The only proof, the only way it's the same mountain is this one man in the history of humanity saying the same mountain is Ramakrishna. So he, in a way, gives rubber stamp to the idea of pluralism. No other, no other prophet, ancient or modern, come anywhere, comes anywhere near giving this that wonderful way of reconciling various religious pathways of Hindus as well as other pathways used by other prophets. First person in the history of humanity. That's why I told you, he said, Avatar of Arishthai. So how can we be sure that we are all going on the same mountain or Different mountains. Different mountains. No, we can, unless you become Ram Krishna, you can't verify it. The only thing, the only person who is given this rubber stamp is the same mountain, is, is Ram Krishna. Because theologically or intellectually, you can say, no, there are different mountains. How do you know? They seem to be talking a different thing altogether. But the only way, person who can say, no, no, same mountain, I'm telling you, even though they say this is the scenario, this is the scenario, the destination is the same, is this Ram Krishna. Uh, once you said that uh, when you go higher and you see uh, people of other tradition, you feel more affinity with them. Can is I, that a proof? Yes, that's the proof. Wonderful thing is this. I said it at one of these Christian meetings. They said, Mr. Lakhan, tell us about pluralism. I said, one of the beautiful kind of examples I can use. This is not Ramkar, this is me, a little tiddler. I said, one of the tiddler is, the example is this. Suppose you're in a circle and you're trying to reach the center. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you compare our directions of reaching the center, all the directions are different. You think plural, this means Relativism, anything goes. All of us will have different directions to follow to reach the center. So even though we are using different compasses, different ways to reach the center, the, the result is going to be the same center. But you say, how can you be sure? And one of the beautiful things I just made up sure. for fun. I said, if you are sincere about your own tradition and progress to the towards center promoted by your tradition, and somebody next to you is also using his own prescription, different direction to reach the center, as we get closer to the center, somehow, by natural, we feel affinity for each other. We don't feel like, I know it is using different angle. We just feel comfortable with it. We just come closer together as we reach the center. While if we move away from the center, we are at logarithm with people sitting next to us. This is the proof of, in a way, lovely way of saying, <clears throat> this is an intellectual gymnastic to suggest the same destination. But the Ram Krishna is not intellectual gymnastic, it's experience, it's a genuine experience. Okay. Sir, we've done a playlist on uh, say Ram Krishna uh, that viewer can view on YouTube. Uh, can we do a shorter version of what Ram Krishna is all about and why we need to study his life and teachings? Indeed, you see, I mean, because I'm I, I'm stuck with Ram Krishna. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, "Did Ram Krishna find you, or did you find Ram Krishna?" I said, "Actually, he found me and he turned me into his slave. So I was <laughs> devoted my life to him." Now, what we did is we have actually done recording, long recording, I think about 12 episodes of half an hour each on the Katha, if I can use the word of Sri Ramakrishna, and that is available. If you go on Hindu Academy channel, YouTube channel, just Hindu Academy YouTube channel, and then look at the playlist, right at the bottom will be the story of Sri Ramakrishna. And there are about 12 episodes, very detailed information regarding how this young, this lovely individual progressed spiritually and what, is our, what are his teaching. Feel free to look at those videos. But anyway, this is a shorter version, if you like. Um, sir, some people like to read books rather than watch videos or sort of uh, additional, uh, you know, uh, things. So, would you recommend any book for uh, to study yes, yes. Ram Krishna? Indeed. Look, <clears throat> there are two books that are considered with the authority on the story of Sri Ram Krishna. One is called the Gospel of Sri Ram Krishna, written by one of his disciples, a householder disciple a school teacher called Mahindranath Gupta. That's a beautiful material. That's fantastic because he used to actually write a diary, visit Ramakrishna, write a diary of what he was saying on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the only proper record of his actual verbal communication with other human beings and his disciples. This is one of the best places. The second place then, you know, is if you like, it's something called the story of the great master. And this is written by Swami Sharadanand, who was one of his chief disciples. 
And this person has done a rigorous th research on Sri Ramakrishna's life story, exactly what day was born, what time was it, etc. And this is a very, this is called the great master uh, and story of Sri Ramakrishna by Swami Sharadana. These are the two main books of authority on the story of Sri Ramakrishna. But then there are other recent ones that have been coming out. So one is said, they lived with God or God lived with them. And these are lovely books written by the Ramakrishna order regarding all the various people who came in contact with Sri Ramakrishna. But this is if you like the source. We are stuck with this video stuff and you can go on YouTube channel and give a sh faster version. But if you really are sincere, read up the book, especially the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. If it doesn't thrill you, nothing else will thrill you, my friends. Yeah. Despite his mastery of such vast array of spiritual experience, very few people were attracted to him during his lifetime. Even now, how do you explain this? Yes, as I said, the reason is this. Here is a first spiritual giant who is not out to start a sectarian movement in his own name. Because if he was talking about pluralism, many ways to be spiritual, he cannot start his own little movement and say, okay, I'm the superior movement, because then he's in the same boat. So he never bothered to set up, a, if you like, a spiritual movement, a sectarian movement in his name. If he had done it, he would have been more popular than any of the modern kind of would-be or the supposedly gurus in the, in, in, in the scene. He would have been far more dynamic. He never wanted because it goes against what he was talking about. Many ways to be spiritual. So rather than say, this is my way, you must follow me. He said, many ways. So he was kind of here to reconcile rather than start a new movement, sectarian movement in his own name. That is why one reason. Second and the third reason why I love is this. I did say it at the start of the program. I said, this man, if you want magic and miracles, he has no time for you. You would keep your rational faculty switched on because when you start believing in magic and miracles, your rational, rational faculty has been switched off. You're finished. Because then you're open to all hobgoblins be throwing your face. Yes, this happened and this happened. So here he said, nothing doing. So no magic, even though his life, when you look at his life, is highly mysterious. And yet he doesn't focus on it at all. He's talking in a very in a rational manner. So again, this is what ordinary human beings like, magic and miracle. The third thing that the ordinary human beings, as I mentioned earlier, like is somebody, some great prophet to say, become like his you know, fourth emergency chain, you know, emergency service. So I'm in trouble health-wise, wealth-wise, my mother, my wife is running away. You've got all these problems. So for them, this Ramakrishna is absolutely no good. Because if anybody went near him asking for this kind of favors, he said, go away. The only favor he'll do, see the power of this man, is if you want spiritual enlightenment, come to me. If you want material things, go away. Yeah, I tell you how he used to do that. When he was in the Dakshineshwar temple, garden house, he, lots of people would flock, not lots, but a few would flock in, and he would know straight where this person has come for some personal needs. So this is a very weird fellow. He said, the gardens are so nice. Go and visit the gardens. He would send them off. And he was very particular. He, would not be, he was not going to get caught up. In fact, another example I give is this. This guy used to go into deep meditation and mention the word spirit or body. He'd go into deep meditation and actually lose body consciousness. And one of these days, it they, they, they happened to him. In fact, a little funny story. He used to wear one piece of white cloth. And when he went into deep meditation, sometimes standing up and goes to deep meditation, the white cloth would fall down. And the disciples, a few of them would run and tie it up, you know, the poor man. And he, once he toppled over and he broke his arm. Mm -hmm. So they had to put, a, you know, put the arm in a sling. And this Sri Ramakrishna not at all bothered about it. He said, good. You know why good? He said, people who come here to get their health problems sorted out, will look at me and say, "This look at this holy man. He can't sort himself out. How is he going to sort me out? He look at his, his arm is in a sling. So they walk, they'll go away from me. He said, good. <laughs> so it's good to have this. So this is the humor and the sincerity of the genuine spiritual master of this age. Uh, could you give us a little background of his childhood? Indeed, we must look at the childhood. You see, I'm not very good with, with, with uh, dates and all that, but this date I remember. On 18th of February, 1836, in a small village called Kamar Pukur, near Calcutta, was born this young man, young boy. He was called Gadadhar initially. Later on, some I don't know how, he acquired the name Ramakrishna. Now, the reason why I love is that when you look at the story of this boy, this is a story of, if you like, the genuine master. At the age of six, see how the powerful it is. He was walking in the paddy, paddy field near his village and eating puff rice. You know, little children eating little puff rice and walking. And while he was walking, a storm came up. And the dark black clouds boom, came over the sky. And this boy, eating his puff rice, looked up. And the black clouds, he saw a, 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 a 
you know, kind of a group of herons, white herons, flying past the dark cloud. He just looked at it and the beauty of the whole th surrounding was so overwhelming, he went into deep meditation without, without any prompting, without realizing what the heck was happening to him, into the deepest meditation and fell off because it was such a dynamic experience. And people say, what was it? You know, he fell down, was it epileptic fit or something? No, see, this is what actually happened to him, I'm telling you. At the very young age of six, this boy achieved the highest, if you like, spiritual experience the Hindus talk about. This experience called Brahmagdan. Brahmagdan. When you are able to experience yourself as one with the whole of this creation, the subject object divide is disappears. This is the height of Hindu philosophy. Brahmagnan. Knowledge that underpinning this reality is not what it appears to be, not the material world, but something great that links me and the creation in no uncertain terms in a very dynamic and intense experience. The, the experience is so intense, you can't bear your body, you can't feel your body and we topple over and you are in that deep state. So at the age of six, see I'm telling you why this man is special. This young boy at the age of six hit the jackpot, the highest of the Hindu tradition, Brahmagnan. Now, everything else that happened to him afterwards is down the hill. This is the height of Hindu experience. Brahmagnan at the age of six. And he was like that, lying there, and the people in the village said, what's happened to the boy? They lifted him and took him home. He was like that for, I don't know, for about 24 hours in that state of Brahmagnan. So you see, he's already a stuff in the highest Hindu ex experiential dimension at a very young age. So from now on, anything else that happens to him is going down the hill. He has got the jackpot at the age of six. And the people said, like, how do you explain this? Let me tell you. Beautiful example, again given by Ramakrishna. It's like this, he said. When you go to a lakeside, there's some you know green kind of moss floating on the lake side. You can't see the water at all. The lake is covered with this green moss. And you look at it. And you take a stick and you push the green moss away. And for a moment you see the clear water. But then once you take the stick out, suddenly all the moss kind of start comes dancing back and kind of hee -hee, covers up the water again. And you say, Oh, this is what Ramaknan is about. When you actually experience the underpinning to reality, it's like all this external is pushed aside. You get a glimpse of it. But again, I'm telling you from experience. And then the moss comes dancing back and you're back to your normal self. You say, oh dear, what happened to me? I just had the depth of knowledge and suddenly all the moss comes and covers me up again, covers up the experience of Brahmagnan. This is the story of Ramakrishna. At the very young age, hit the highest spiritual experience Hindus have been talking about for thousands of years. This is the story of this wonderful giant. And what happened when he first uh, went in a play as a ah, Seva? Yeah, 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 yeah. Then another funny story. Yeah, they all funny story with Ramakrishna. You see, in the village, they decided to celebrate Shivaratri by doing a play on Lord Shiva. Now, the young boy is going to play Lord Shiva's head stomach trouble, diarrhea. So they can't have Shiva standing and then suddenly going, ah, I need to go to the toilet, you can't have that. So the village, who to catch hold of? They caught, caught, caught all of this, you know, Gadadhar. They say, you play Shiva. And Gadadhar plays along. It's like, no problem, I play. So they, you know, in the village, what do you expect? They put some kind of skinny stuff on his arm, a little thing that looks like a little rope that looks like a snake. is okay, he's Shiva. A little trident, you know, kind of bits of stick. They put him on the stage. He's now supposed to play the part of Shiva and he's got to learn his lines. The moment he was put, this is real story, very funny and very exciting story. Now, this boy, if you prompt him to take on a role of God or, or spirit, he goes into the role actually, not in just on the play. So here he went, Shiva went. He's holding his trident, standing there on the stage, and his eyes were filled with tears of joy, flowing down. He is now Shiva. So he's actually experiencing himself as Shiva. He's standing there. The lines of the play are forgotten. The villagers don't know what to do with this boy. He's just standing there with tears, you know, tears of joy flowing. What can I do? They have to lift him and take him away. And the play stopped. <laughs> so you don't prompt this man to talk about God or spirituality. He goes into deep meditation immediately. You see, for people like us, getting rid of the ego is a hell. It's difficult to get rid of this ego. Ego is a real problem. It blocks us from seeing our spiritual self. With this man, it's exactly opposite. He had difficulty in hanging on to his ego. You won't believe this. In the, in the depth of his meditation, because he keeps going into that, he has difficulty linking up with his body. The body keeps toppling over. And it's difficult to bring him down to earth and link up with the body. And this is, you see, see the difference. We struggle to get rid of the ego. He struggles to hang on to the ego. Otherwise, he can't operate with us. He can't talk to us. This is the story. <laughs> um, sir, about his education, uh, did, how, how much did he study and 
where did he get all the knowledge that he passed on to his uh, disciple of his? <laughs> My go-to will like this part of the answer. He hated maths. He hated maths. He's supposed to be the great avatar. He hated maths. My daughter said, good, I like him. I hate maths as well. <laughs> so what he did, this is what happened to him. At the age of about 11, his father passed away. Now it is said that at a very young age, if the father passes away, the boy really feels withdrawn. He feels really hit hard. The father is his, 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 his you know, steadfast helper. Now he's gone. So the boy went inwards. He started sp spending time in the cremation ground, thinking of higher things. Because he already had Brahmagnan. So it come naturally for him to kind of be attracted to this idea of spirituality, religion, etc. So he went in a kind of inward mode and he said, why should I study so that I can earn a little bit of food to eat? Just to fill my stomach, I study and give my whole life to it. He had experienced the Brahmagnan. That is why he cannot relate to it. So his knowledge, was, his, his, his education was very limited, but he is not bothered mm -hmm. because his education was the higher kind, not the worldly kind, which allows us to earn a living and survive. His knowledge was a higher kind. That's what he, that is why he, in a way, spent the rest of his life at this high, very high spiritual plane. Um, how did he end up in Dakshineswar Kali Mandir? And uh, could you please tell us about his time at Dakshineswar Temple? Indeed. You see, his older brother, Ram Kumar, was appointed as a priest. Now, this boy is not bothered to become a priest. He doesn't want to do, uh, you know, earn a living doing priestly stuff. He's not bothered. But Ram Kumar was, you know, made into a priest at Al Kali Temple. And there's a reason why it was Ram Kumar who accepted the job. Mm. There was a, a person called Rani Rasmani who had built a huge Kali Temple because she had a dream of Mother Goddess saying, build a temple for me. But then she had to kind of donate the temple, make sure there are, you know, kind of uh, accredited priest, Brahmin priest to run it. And she couldn't find anybody. And then she found Ram Kumar. So she appointed him as a chief priest. So he said, fine. He went there. And this Ram Krishna was messing around in Kamar Bhubu. So he said, come with me. And Ram Krishna, no problem. He went with him. And there Ram Krishna would just sit near the bank of the river Ganga and, and kind of make molds of, you know, gods and goddesses. He loved to just play with gods and goddesses. Mm. But then tragedy stuck. Ram Kumar passed away suddenly. Mm. So Rani Rasmani said, what to do? Where do you get replacement? They saw this boy who was very devout, very sincere, very straightforward. So they said, this is the right chap. Let's make him the temple priest. They had to fight him to be, take on the role of being a temple priest at Kali Temple in Nakshaneshwar. Mm. Finally agreed. Maybe divine, you know, providence. He agreed. And then the fun began. Now, once he's there, I told you, this man is experiential Hinduism, mm -hmm. not intellectual. So he was waving his lamp in the image of Mother Goddess and said, is she for real or a stone? He asked, started asking him. See, he, this kind of guy will ask stuff like that. He's got Brahmagnan already in the background. Mm -hmm. He's saying, is this for real or not? Keep waving the lamp, saying, Mother Goddess, are you for real or just make believe? Just piece of stone. And this caught hold of him. So he said, for, for years, he said, I want, if you are for real, come and show yourself to me. Now he's here, Manish Bhai, we are seeing a reconciliation between the idea of Brahmagnan and the idea of Mother Goddess or Father God, idea of God with form and, at, and, and attributes. This is the reconciliation of, in the story of Sri Ramakrishna. He said, if you are for real, show yourself. And Mother Goddess doesn't turn up that easily. So finally he said, if you don't show us, I'm going to kill myself. He's, he's capable of doing that. And at that time, at that stage, because then he sees broken the mold, what he has done is this, Manish Bhai. The Brahman that is homeless, Nirgun Nirakar, he said, I want to see you as Sagun Sakar with form and with attributes and as a mother, not father god. Ah, the boring chaps, mother goddess. Come and show yourself to me, mother. So he was imploring Brahman that he had experienced to take on a form and play with him. And this is not an easy task because to get this great Brahman, this Nirgu Niraka Brahman, to take on a form requires tremendous effort. And that's what he had to do. He said, you become Mother Goddess for me and come and play with me. And this has actually happened at the expense. This is why this experiential religion. So in no time, he was able to experience Mother Goddess playing with him, talking to him, joking with him, dancing with him in the temple garden, in the, in the temple, temple, you know, pet, petio. And he said, wow, is, can, this is possible? You know, when I was a young boy, I visited that Dakshinesh just to go and stand in the place where Ramakrishna used to play with the mother goddess. And it's a very sacred place, sanctified place. You can just imagine Brahman forced to take on a form and play, interact with human beings here. And the story is very beautiful. And the mother goddess was so impressed. This is the story. You see, normally when you see all the great, other great, you know, kind of, you know, bhaktas, 
devotees of God. They get a glimpse of God, say Mira gets a glimpse of Krishna or etc. Tusida gets a glimpse of Ram and they get hold, their life gets charged up and they're lo right lo lovely material. So they get a glimpse and they, they charges them up. Here in the story of Ram Krishna, the appearance of Mother Goddess was not instantaneous, temporary, ding, and then disappeared. And then he used to cry all his life, where are you, Mother Goddess? Nothing of the sort. Mother Goddess would not leave him alone. Day and night she's with him. When he gets up, she's standing next to him. Hello, like that. So how can this happen? There is nobody in the history of Hinduism where the experience of even the, the, in, in the story of Chaitanya, Chaitanya gets a glimpse and he gets whoo, whoo, charged up. Here, first time, we see an individual able to take on the experience of God permanently for seven days a week, day and night. She would not leave him alone. Now, you see, it's written that if you get God experience, it is such an intense experience that even your pores in your in your body will bleed, start to bleed. You can't bear it. With Chaitanya, we had that. With Ram Krishna, no blood. You could bear the experience of the Mother Goddess because he had generated her. You see, he's the one who generated her. So he could bear the experience, interact with her in a beautiful way. It's such a lovely thing. I'll just touch on some of the stories. One day he said, when I woke up, I saw Mother Goddess standing next to me. And she said, my boy, I love you. Of course, this is the kind of interaction he has with Brahman. I love you. I brought this thing. She showed a little basket. In it was name and fame and wealth. And she said, I got this for you. He said, Mother Goddess, what are you trying to do? You are trying to deprive me of my Brahman Grant, my, my experience of spirit. You are getting, you are giving me this obstruction. How dare you? I spit on it. <laughs> you can only talk to the Mother Goddess like, I'm going to spit on it. Take it away. And Mother Goddess smiled and <laughs> went away. This boy cannot be formed off, cannot be bought out with health, wealth, or whatever, you know, name and fame. He could be bothered. <laughs> so when I heard that the story, I give another story. This is, shows the reality of Ram, uh, Mother Goddess interacting with Ram Krishna. Now, when Ram Krishna used to see Mother Goddess in the courtyard, in the temple courtyard, the sun would be out. And of course, nobody else can see him because she he's seeing her with his, his, his divine eyes because he's seeing the real. Brahman turning into human form. And then he said, Mother, stand like a little child. Mother, where is your shadow? And even in the morning, he couldn't find the shadow. At night, with a little oil lamp, you'll go around her looking for her shadow. Where does she cast a shadow? And no shadow. So he looked at child. He said, Mother, um, I want to ask you, where is your shadow? Mother could have said, See the power. This is not make believe. This can only not come from a real experience of God. Mother Goddess said, look, my boy, it is with my light, everything lights up, including the sun and the moon. It is my light that lights them up. How can anything throw light on me? Tell me, my boy, how can there be a shadow? See, now this depth of philosophy teaching can only come from first an experience of God. And this is what I see in the story. Why? Another time they'll tell you a funny story. At a later stage, Sri Ramakrishna developed throat cancer. And he's not bothered about the body. The body is external. He's going to ditch it. He's not bothered. But his little few disciples were very worried. So might be going to lose our master, like we were kind. They were worried. Mm. And they said, please, you are a great yogi. Focus your mind on that part of the throat. This is what the Yoga Sutra says. You can get rid of the disease. Boom, like that. And Rapunzel says, I've taken my mind off the body. How can I focus on this part of the body? So they said, this guy is difficult. <laughs> so they found a second way. They said, ah, why don't you ask the Mother Goddess to remove this? And rather like a child, a guileless child all his life. He said, okay, okay. So when, because when he went in the temple, he didn't see the image of God. He sees the actual Mother Goddess standing, waiting for hello, like that. So he went in. In a few minutes, he came out very looking, very upset. He, he came out very upset. He said, I couldn't ask her. Said, Why can't you ask her? Go and ask again. He said, no, I can't. I said, mother, these are his words. I said, mother, can you do something so I can eat? He didn't sound to leave. I want to keep the, he said, can you, so I can't eat at the moment because it's painful. Can you do something too so I can eat? So simple, sounds so simple. Mm -hmm. Guileless like a child. He said, Mother Goddess told me something that made me feel so ashamed of myself. My boy, said the Mother Goddess, don't you see? You are the one eating through every mouth in the universe. You are. It is you alone who is eating through all these mouths. So why are you bothered about it? And he said, I felt so miserable. I said, I felt so ashamed that I asked her. Mm -hmm. You see, this they couldn't stop him. They see, they can't use all the tricks to try and somehow let him survive. Mm -hmm. This is the end part of his story. Mm -hmm. I keep floating away Man Manish Bhai because I love this guy, as you can see. <laughs> can I ask you a personal question? How did you get attracted to him? Yeah, 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 you can ask me a personal question. I am very keen to talk about stuff like that. You see, from a very young age, I was always looking for like a source of spirituality. Somehow it attracted me from a very young age, mm -hmm. from the age of 
five, seven, I was studying all the heavy literature, uh, Tago, everything I studied at age of 10, 11, I read up everything. And I was still not satisfied. I was still looking around. I said, where do I find the depth of Hindu teaching? I wanted it. I don't want intellectual stuff and Puranis and Pujaris and, and, and Pandits. I'm looking for somebody who's actually experienced it. And then my attention turned to Sri Ramakrishna. I tell you a funny story. I was studying, I just started at Imperial College, uh, doing my physics first year. And then I said, okay, my mother, my younger brother, three of us went on pilgrimage to India. First thing I went in, when I went to Mumbai, I went to a Gujarati bookshop. And just by, you know, somehow just felt I bought the complete work of Swami Vivekananda in Gujarati, not in English, Gujarati. That's my journey beginning. Mm -hmm. And then during the pilgrimage, we went to Dakshineshwar. And when I visited the temple, the courtyard where this fun was taking place, I was actually went into weird state. I became very, very seriously ill. I would have died. Suddenly something went in. I just couldn't bear it. And for two days, I was almost unconscious. This is a real story. And my mother had to nurse me. My younger brother had nursed me and somehow I recovered. But something it, I felt has really entered my system right from that, that age. And then I came here and suddenly in December of that year, Complete works of Vivekananda arrived. And I said, oh good, I was looking for this. Start, I'm very fluent in Gujarati, so I started reading. The first volume is Story of Sri Ramakrishna. I read about 55, 60 pages and suddenly everything turned for me because I told you, it's not that I have found Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna has found me and said, okay, this guy is okay. Let me use him as a vehicle. So something grabbed me and I went to deepest meditation, just reading the story of Ramakrishna. Just page 60 or something, that's enough. And I was in the deep meditation for a long, long period. And whatever I'm speaking has got a strong experiential dimension. And this began with the story of Ramakrishna. This is my link with Ramakrishna. And I feel that I'm nothing but a servant. And I'm just doing his bidding. So all this work I do is really at his bidding. And I wish I can come to some kind of conclusion because this guy is you know, sucking the blood out of me at the moment. But so be it. But this is the story. Sorry, I shouldn't be talking about my private life, but it's important. Yeah, that's good, sir. Um, why did he marry <laughs> Sardamani there? People are weird. You see, this guy, he established God consciousness, seeing Mother Goddess and all that. And uh, what had happened is, at one stage, in, in those days in India, you would have child marriages. It was basically to protect women from being abducted and all that. And somehow, uh, Sardamani was only, I think, six or seven, and he was about 17, they got them married. It's just basically there's no physical contact. It's purely a tokenistic gesture and they live separately. That's when there's no, no communication. And I, mean, I thought, why Shardamani and what is this? She has a very important role to play in the story of Sri Ramakrishna. She, he needed somebody to be the carrier, the, be the, be the spiritual head of the, of the kind of movement that was beginning to come, take it, take it, take place. So he, Shardamani was a perfect candidate for that. She had no physical attraction, no physical intimacy with Ramakrishna at any stage. Mm -hmm. And yet she became the biggest carrier, the token of Sri Ramakrishna. And it is she who really initiated lots and lots of lay disciples, lay people to become the monks of the Ramakrishna order. And she has been a major, major kind of proponent of his teachings without the lecturing. And she has some of, some of the wonderful things she has said in very simple words are very dynamic. He said once, my boy, if you want peace, See this world, we always see other human beings as obstruction, you know, lim limiting us, getting irritable. You know, all of the people you find irritable. Even in the street, I was, oh, irritable. He said, my friend, my boy, look at every human being as if you like your very own. You sound like very uh, sweet thing. No, but actually it can, you can try it out. The moment you look at other human beings as your very own, somehow the world changes, your, 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 your attitude to life changes. And this brings about natural cohesion, natural uh, compassion for the whole of creation. It makes you spiritual. Just using this simple ploy, she said, my boy, make everybody your very own. It sounds so simple and you're very dynamic material. So this Sharanamani was not an ordinary person in any sense. In fact, Sri Ramakrishna used to tell his disciple, if you mess me up, if you make me angry, nothing will go wrong. Don't worry. If you mess up this lady, you are in big trouble. Watch it. Because if she's in your favor, everything will work in your favor. If you are, if you upset her, God help you, nobody can help you, <laughs> used to tell that. So he said, she is hidden, a very hidden power that mm -hmm. is kind of visible as a female companion of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, could you tell uh, something about his disciples? Uh, how did they come to find him? Very interesting. You see, as this person was not here to start a movement in his name, give kind of intellectual lectures, 
you will establish in spiritual experience through and throughout. So, you see, as I said, more ordinary human beings cannot, even today cannot relate to that. They cannot relate to this external razmatas and, you know, movements and sectarian, you know, getting together and applauding and singing or the kathas and bhajan. They can't be attracted to deeper vision of spirituality. So, even though he was more established in spirituality than anybody I know of, there were very few people who were prepared to come near him. Mm -hmm. Very few people. So, this is what happened. A few youngsters, boys like Narendra, kind of were attracted to him. And again, Narendra was an atheist and he was challenging all the people being religious, saying, are you, are, are you sure? Have you seen God? He used to go around challenging people. So one day he went to Devendra Tagore, Ravindra Tagore's father said, hey, sir, you call yourself Maharishi, Maharishi. That means you must have seen God. Have you seen God? And Devendra Tagore said, oh, your eyes look like lotus flower. Vivekananda said, no good, no good, go away. So he walked out. So this is why he was in search of a deeper, like I said, experiential religion, not just belief system. So he was wandering around and he came across Ramakrishna. He didn't want to visit him in the beginning. So he said, he's a rustic man, a, a temple priest. What can he tell me? I will study all the philosophy of the Western world. What can this guy teach me? So he wouldn't go near him. The one day he went there, a wonderful story, wonderful encounter. And we listened to Ramakrishna. He seemed like a good, good man, talking sensible stuff. But at the end, he took out his you know, arrow that he has sharpened and fired at Ramakrishna. Sir, you talk about God. Have you seen God? He's a killer. In fact, I tell all the Hindus in modern India, you are following this and that guru or this and that prophet or this and that, you know, whatever. They call themselves with all these labels. Go and ask them this question. Sir, you talk about this. Have you seen God? We're just talking about it. Just waffle. Just kind of doing narratives. Have you seen God? Ask them. Go and ask them. I'm telling you, challenging you. Go and ask them. All of them will be knocked out. Not a single one will put his hand up and say, yes, I know. So when Vivekananda fired, Narendra fired this question, he expected them waffle like the in the Tagore. Instead of that, this Ramakrishna up to the mark said, My boy, I see God more clearly than you now. You see, when he said, if he said, Yes, I see God, that's, that's a you know, seems like a cop out. He says, see more intensely than I see you. You are fuzzy. Straight away, that is taken away. It that makes sense. If you see God offering much more intense experience than me seeing you, this guy hit it. In the second fire, the thing that came back from Ramakrishna Vivekan was this, my boy, I can show her to you. Nobody says stuff like that. So first Narendra thought this guy is mad. But after a few meetings, he realized he was a real master, a great master. Not only establishing good experience, he's able to pass on his good experience to anybody he likes. Mere glance, he can lift anybody to hit the jackpot. Look at this little tiddler here. So it's the power to influence people, to give them, if you like, this high spiritual experience. If you ask for it, he'll give it to you. If you ask for anything else, he will give you nothing. Warning, you don't even do any, you know, offering, say, do this, I'll offer this and this to you. You will say, go away. You, in fact, he will not give you what you're asking for. So don't ask anything from him except good experience. So this is how this Narendra got caught. But not in Narendra. There were about half a dozen, wait, a dozen youngsters, 16, 17, 18 year olds, who were attracted to him. He was talking sensible stuff in a very genuine, sincere manner, you know, establishing good experience. So when a person with good experience talks, his language, his words, his, his mannerism will hit the target. Will, the audience will say, oh, yes, yes. But most people interested in worldly affairs will run away. So in the, during his time, Keshav Chandra Sen, the head of the Brahmo Samaj in, in Calcutta, was very popular, great speaker, great orator, and 5,000 people gather around and applaud him when he speaks. But this Ramakrishna, dozen youngsters floating around, penniless chaps. That, that's all. This is what the, the, the sign of spirituality not money-oriented, not intellectual gymnastic, genuine experience, established. And only those who are interested in that will go near him. So in, during his lifetime, in, in fact, one of the interesting is Esh Keshavjana was saying, the head of this uh, Brahmo Samaj, once a few times visited him and said, my God, what I'm talking about is experiencing. So he told his followers, this guy is actually experiencing what I'm giving lectures about. I'm just giving lectures. He's actually establishing that. Mm -hmm. And that's why somehow he got caught up. A lot of people started, then started visiting. But again, you would look at the people and say, they're for worldly reasons. They will, you will not interact with them. This is the story of Sri Ramakrishna. Just a dozen youngsters became his dev devout devotees. And this is how the movement progressed. If that not happened, I would not have heard his name today. So how did this guy message get uh, around to the world? <laughs> with great difficulty. It's not even getting through now, as you can see. It's a great pity. Do you know why? You know, I keep talking, Manish, I talk about religion that is contemporary, suitable for our age now. 
is comprehensive, not just saying, okay, this sectarian movement, not that sectarian, not this religion, that religion, it is non-sectarian, is comprehensive. Most contemporary, modern vision, most comprehensive vision, and most rational, sensible vision, structured vision comes from Ramakrishna in his life story. So, this is the reason why very few people can relate this deeper vision. And I keep mentioning this, oh Hindus, wake up. It's nice to hang on to your pre, uh, uh, no, ancient avatars, nothing wrong with them. But the image you created about them is so polished up, it's not real anymore. Here is a real person with words and everything in your lifetime with photographs. You can see his photographs, you can see photographs of Vivekananda. Here is a modern prophet, contemporary one, giving the same message of the ancient rishis in your time, in your own language, suited to this age and suited to the whole world, comprehensive to that extent. Why don't you open your eyes and look at this man and see the modern vision, the contemporary vision of your tradition, most comprehensive vision. So that is why in our little way, we keep plugging away the teachings of Ram Krishna and Swami Vivekananda using our own this gizmo that we, we possess. Sir, so he used to go into deepest meditation just by hearing. We don't see any other uh, person able to go in meditation at all. I mean, we, we don't see anyone experiencing somebody. At the present stage, if you ask me very bluntly, is there any person of this caliber in India or anywhere in the world? I would say, no, my friend, I'm very open-minded. If there was one, I would go and sit at his feet. In fact, when Maharshi Mahesh Yogi came to London first time, mm -hmm. I think it was 1967 or 68, and he gave a lecture at Hilton Hotel in Parkland. And I was a youngster, you know, in search of spirituality. And I already experienced some deep ideas. So I said, let me go and listen to him. In five minutes, I said, this man doesn't know anything. He's just flower power, he, hippie stuff. There's no depth. So I do not know anybody at the moment on the scene who can even say they've got 1% of the experience of Sri Ramakrishna. Let me tell you something else about him. Here is a man who has turned Brahman into a personality to play with. So he's able to reconcile the idea of God as Nirgun Nirakar, Brahman, as well as Sagun Sakar. See, reconciliation at a very deep level, first-hand experiential. One minute you'll be talking about Mother Goddess, next minute you'll be talking about I am Brahman, I am established Brahman, I am Atman. Next minute you say, I am playing with Brahman, with Mother Goddess. In, in, you would able to, he was able to switch from Nirgun Niraka to Sagun Saka like that. You know, the story is interesting, let me touch on this. Once you will start interacting with Mother Goddess, one day a great sage, a great you know, sadhu entered the temple and singing gloriously the Vedic slokas. And he looked at Ram Krishna, young boy, young man there. He said, this man is suitable for the knowledge I possess, Advaita Vedanta. With me and Brahman are the same, Atman and Brahman are the same. I am established in that knowledge, I am fit in that knowledge. Let me pass his knowledge. This boy is so, so good, I must pass it on. By looking at his face, I know he's suitable. So I will definitely give this knowledge to this boy. He said, my boy, I can teach you Advaita Vedanta, the highest Hindu philosophy. Would you like to study? Would you like to study with me? And Ram was like a little child, I told you, guileless. He said, let me check with my mummy. <laughs> he said, a grown-up man, you want to go and check with his mummy whether I can give him this highest knowledge? And the, the, the name of the sadhu is Totapur. He said, let him go. Well, let's see what a weird chap. And ran into the temple, came back saying, yes, yes, yes. You can teach me because my mother said she has brought you here. And this Totapur said, I, nobody asked me to come here. He said, his mother has brought me here. I don't know, he's a nut, but let me teach him. So he said, okay, we are going to touch on the deepest vision of Hinduism, that you are the spirit, Atman, I'm going to give that knowledge. So the, the, the disciple and the guru decided to start the journey. Early morning, Ram Krishna took a bath, went to see him in a little hut near the temple. We sit in the hut, said Todapuri, and focus now. He asked Ram Krishna to close his eyes, focus between the eyebrows, and go into deep mess, just focusing on the eyebrow here, between the eyebrows. And after a few seconds, Ram Krishna came out saying, I can't, I can't. Stop, he said, why not? He said, my mother keeps coming. What mother, he said. He's again, focus there. Then Todapuri picked up a piece of glass that was in the time. You know, in huts in India, you can find everything there. Piece of glass and made a mark in the, in the forehead. Said, now focus there, all the pain. See the pain? Focus on that. No mother God, no mommy is here. And Ram Krishna closed his eyes and these are his words. He said, the moment I close my eyes, I see the mother God is coming up. And I took the sword of discrimination saying, no mother God is today. Boom, cut her. Can you see me here? Cut mother God is. If the moment I did it, I went to deepest meditation and I experienced myself as a spirit. This was natural, he's already touched Brahmagnan, so Atmagnan is not a big, big thing for him, but he went like that, boom, instantaneously. So Dhotapuri said, it took me about 14 years to master this, and this guy is going in two seconds. Weird fellow. 
And he said, let me, let me leave him. So he left him there. He actually locked the heart so that nobody disturbs him and walked away. Even second day, he's still sitting in deep meditation, face radiant with Atma Gnan. Totapuri said, this is incredible. What took me hundreds, uh, tens of years, this guy achieved in two minutes. Then again, he closed the door, went the third day. And still he's sit sitting in deep meditation with Atma Gnan. So Totapuri now got worried. He said, I've sent him off. You're not going to come back to the body now. This is not right. So he tried to wake him. He started, you know, loudly saying, you know, this idea of uh, Hari Om Tatsat, Hari Om Tatsat in his ear to wake him up. And after a lot of Hari Om Tatsat, this Ram Krishna opened his eyes. Yes, and I know. Uttapari said, my boy, cry tears flowing. He said, my boy, what took me so many years, you achieved instantaneously. Why? And the answer from Ram Krishna is very simple. My mommy made it. <laughs> See the reconciliation of Advait and Dwait in one lifetime. And this is the beautiful story of Sri Ramakrishna, jumping from Dvait to Advait, from Nirgun Nirakan to Sagun Sakar, and touching on all the various religions at the same time. We understand that he practiced and tested his various Hindu pathways, as we see, Advait Vedanta there, to see what they lead to. Can you say something about this? Yes. He tried almost every pathway the Hindus have been prescribing. First, first one of the other teacher he had was called Bhairvi Brahmani. Now she was, you know, kind of practicing, you know, the idea of tantra, tantra mark. Now Hindus call it the palm mark, means the left-handed path of making spiritual progress. It's kind of vilified, saying that it's to do with sex and getting drunk and all that. So people shy away from it. I agree with them. If you shy away, it's not the main pathway. But this Bhairavi came to teach him tantra, and Ramakrishna said, "No problem. I check with my mummy. You can teach me." And this is not easy. He didn't drink wine, he didn't you know, participate in sexual activity, but by mere, you know, kind of instantaneous touch, he was able to use the tantric mark because we have vilified the unnecessary. Tantra simply says, keep away from the idea of aversion and attraction. We, every time we see the universe, we immediately kind of classify it as attractive or aversion, avert it, go away from it. Tantra mark is saying, if you can rise above it, this is what the idea of tantra is really, then you can become spiritually enlightened. So the very thing that kind of makes us kind of become like a like an animal, if you can control it, it'll take you to the spiritual dimension. And this Ramakrishna tried. So in fact, Ramakrishna tried the Vaishnava pathway, the Shaiva pathway, uh, the, the the every different pathway, say Madhur bhav, Bal bhav, you know, Bal, every Vatsalya bhav, every bhav you can think about in Hindu tradition, he tried out and he reached the same destination with all of them. My friend, I can simply conclude by saying, if you're not coming across the story of Sri Ramakrishna and what he stands for, you miss the point. This is the more than clearest vision of spirituality. And we've talked about it in brief, but you can explore it in detail by going to a YouTube channel and looking at the playlist called Sri Ramakrishna story. There are lots of colorful stories there. And after this, we are going to produce another series, another short version of the teachings and life of Swami Vivekananda. Thank you, my friends.